All right, my name is David Ulbrich, and this is September 7th, 2007. What is your full name, sir? Uh, David Charles Vartanian. And when and where were you born? Chicago, Illinois, uh, August the 21st, 1924. Which squadron were you in? With the, with the uh, 376, I was in the 515th, but I had transferred out of another bomb group, which was the 456, where I flew my missions there. Um, when did you uh, enter the military? I volunteered as soon as I turned 18 to stay out of the infantry, to be honest. And uh, I talked to too many World War I people. They told me about trench life, stuff like that. didn't sound good to me. So I enlisted right after my uh, 18th birthday in, in August. And uh, I got sworn in downtown Chicago in December the 15th, 1942. That's actually common enough, I hear from a lot of the guys that volunteered rather than so they could choose where they went. It's I, sort of nice to be able to choose, and you know, the ads showed, you know, the, the aviator with a smile and the white scarf and all that. And it looked more appealing than anything in the ground to me. <laughs> well, I, I've done some work with Marines, and the Marines, yeah. like the uniform, the guy, they would rather join the Marines than the Army. Of course, the Marines had it tough, too. Yeah, <laughs> everybody ground. had it tough. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that's very interesting to me. Uh, I, I've worked with, you know, Marines and soldiers on the ground, and mm -hmm. you know, I talked with guys who went in on Omaha Beach, and I, in order to reach out to them, I, I uh, told them that, you know, I'm the son of a veteran who flew yeah. in the la later Pulaski missions, and their eyes get really big. And I said, I'm glad I was in the yeah. foxhole and not over there. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that you're, you almost end up being glad where you were. You wouldn't want to be in the other guy's shoes. Right. I mean, I talked to too many people from World War I. I sure. remember them. Sure. My sure. father-in-law was the telegrapher, my first marriage, he was the telegrapher for General Pershing. Wow. His personal telegrapher. Wow. That must have been Because he was pretty good. He used to work for Western Union, and he, he could, you know, operate this stuff pretty good. And he ended up being a very good job, you know. Sure. Didn't get shot at. <laughs> So you, uh, you, you volunteered, and as, as you said, in August 42, were sworn in in December 42? Was, or no, you yeah. turned 18 in August. I had to wait like I turned 18. I, wanted to, I didn't want to go to the draft board, so I went and joined up. I used to live in Crown Point, Indiana at that time. We had moved to Crown Point. And I went down to the draft board after I got sworn in. I said, by the way, I want to let you know, you know, I'm in the service. He said, you can't do that. He says, you've got to come in and tell us first. He says, you can't. I says, I've already done it. I've been sworn in. <laughs> He says, it's highly irregular. He says, you're supposed to come and tell us first. <laughs> they didn't like that. Sure, sure. Looking back a little bit before uh, World War yeah. II started, before Pearl Harbor, um, what was like, what were the hardships like during the Great Depression for you? I know we didn't have a lot. My father was, we lived in New York and also Chicago at that time. And uh, we did, when we were living in New York, I was quite young. With my early years were in New York, in Brooklyn. And I remember my dad was in the carpeting business, and during the war, not many people bought carpeting or anything like that. It was the kind of commodity, if times were good, yes, but when times were bad, it's the last thing. So he ended up going into business for himself, finally. First he worked for somebody, and then it was like a feast or famine type thing. He had a, a loft in the fourth, third, fourth floor on Fifth Avenue, not very far from the post office in New York, right there on that area. And now I imagine the rent must have been practically nothing in those days because that's the way things were. And uh, he used to do commercial work, and he'd do all, he did it all himself. You know, he did it put together, installed it, everything. And he was able to some months make as much as three and four hundred dollars a month, which during the depression was a lot of money. And it turned out those were the good months. We had the bad months when there was very little business and. We felt it, and we couldn't, we couldn't even afford to buy a lot of things and food. I remember once, the only thing we had in the house was flour. My mother cooked up some flour and water, put it in the oven, and that's what we had for supper one time. I mean, things were really rough. You were lucky to have a job in those days, and if you had one, it didn't pay very much. Do you think that that experience toughened you for when you were in the service? Well, possibly so. I don't know. All I remember times were a little tough, you know. They gradually got better. But uh, there wasn't really work for my father in that field at all. Then we moved to Chicago. He thought he had an opportunity there, and that sort of fell apart. It didn't work. 
my dad, you know, made good money and all that when he was working, but it ended up that he was in, couldn't even get jobs at all when he was in Chicago, and he was just living from hand to we were living from hand to mouth. So I mean, it was sort of rough, you know. But yeah. you're a kid; you don't notice all those things. No. Really, it doesn't. It's gonna end up being a game, much. almost a game, or not, yeah, not more a... or less. Uh, my dad, and my mother probably worried more than I did. I didn't worry; just we didn't have we didn't have it, you know. It's an awful lot of people in our block in the same boat, you know. Sure. sure. We lived in New York and Brooklyn, and as a working area. Actually, the town was called Canarsie. It's still around. I went there back in '91 when our bomb group went to Italy. We went back to Italy. And uh, my friend Marty, who's in the other room, uh, he lived in, in New York too. So he took me around all my old neighborhoods. I saw my old grammar school and everything else. Several of my grammar schools, we moved a lot, probably due to the, the monetary part of it. So I went to one of the grammar schools while I'm in there. We, we, I told him I know it's in the Sheepshead Bay, just for off Sheepshead Bay, off in that angle. It used to be all vacant land. Of course, it's full of buildings now. I said, if we just keep going that direction, we'll hit it. Sure enough, we find it. been a new building I went to, this grammar school, big one, PS 125. And I see a woman sitting out there on a chair. And I started talking to her, naturally. Turns out we were both in kindergarten. She used to live all over Brooklyn. Then she came back, and she lives like across the street from the school. And she was in kindergarten the same year I was, 1929. Wow. I mean, it was an oddity, you know. And Marty was with me at the time. No, it's a small <laughs> world. That's true, yeah. Um, do you recall where you were or what you were doing when you heard the news about Pearl Harbor? You probably were in high school at that time. Mm. Or either that or just graduated. No, I was out of high school. You were out of high school by then? All right. Yeah, I was uh, yeah, well out of high school. I graduated in January of 42 from high school. All right. And so wait, you're so right though. 42. It's 42. Yeah, December 7th. This, yeah, this is something. Yeah, well, let's see. I'm trying to remember where I was. Well, I was, I had to be around high school time. I don't remember where I was at the time. All right, though. all right. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, the, uh, where did you go for your, your training? How did you get to be a, a a bombardier or a navigator, or I guess bombardier, who was, yeah. could also well, be a navigator. How like did that so happen? many of them, I'm a washed out pilot. I was in primary, I just managed a solo, that's all I did. And then of course, they didn't, at the point in time when we were there, it was in the fall of 1943, they really had enough pilots really. So if you, you didn't look super perfect, you got washed out. And that was my case. So they asked me if I wanted further air crew training, which meant that if you didn't qualify for navigation or bombardier, you would go to gunnery school and you figured in a few months you'd be overseas and all that. And it didn't appeal to me being doing that anyway. So I said, I had a big head. I was young, you know. I said, I probably qualified for all three. So I told him I wanted to be a bombardier. Navigation didn't seem to appeal to me as much being a bombardier. So I talked to one of the ladies in the headquarters there, young girls there, and I says, do me a favor, could you look at I said, we're not allowed to do that. He says, oh, come on, you know, you can die. I've gone, you know, I'm going to find out very shortly. She said, okay. This is after I had made my decision. You were quite decision. the charmer, no doubt. I had qualified for all three. Yeah. Of course, I had a big head, and it turned out it was true. I, but I didn't know, but you have, to, you have to say ahead of time, you know, at that time when you meet the board, do you or do you not want further air crew training? If not, that means the infantry <laughs> in most cases. Sure, sure. And what was training like once you once you were designated as a bombardier cadet, I guess, or an air cadet? Yeah. Well, when I went in to service, I went to uh, Miami Beach, Florida, for basic training. Then we went up to a college in Meadville, Pennsylvania. It was called Allegheny State Teachers College. It's called Allegheny College now, still in Meadville. And uh, we went there for I think college training. We saw, had some courses. And I think for about three or four months we were there. Then we went to Nashville, Tennessee for classification, the usual route, because we're in the Eastern Flying Training Command. And from there, uh, we went to Maxwell Field, Alabama for a pre-flight. And there we had, uh, like before in the, the college, quite a bit of, of physical training and stuff like that. I lost a lot of weight, I know. I went in at 165 in a few short months, maybe half a year, I was down to 143 pounds. <laughs> Wow. So, I mean, you, you know, it's sort of rigorous, but you're young and 
it didn't bother you in any way. I mean, sure. Uh, we used to run for 20 miles without stopping, stuff like that, not real fast. We do that in this college thing even. And uh, of course, in pre-flight, a lot of emphasis in physical training, you know, and we had a great deal of it. Sure, sure. And, and uh, while, you, while you were training, um, did you feel your, your training, I mean, granted, a training is training. It, uh, you know, it's not going to actually be combat, but did you feel you were well prepared through your training? The whole for training? I think so, because you don't really know what, you know what it's like to get shot at, and you know it would happen, but you don't, you don't give it a thought. You're young, you're invulnerable. You know, it's the usual thing. You have a different outlook on life at 18 and 19 than you do when you're older. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about being a bombardier. Um, did, you did you inspect your bombs before takeoff? No, our armor usually did that. I went out and checked them, he, but he took care of the pins and everything else, and it was loaded early in the morning before we got there. The regular ground armors, they went ahead and they loaded all the stuff. Our armor went out to check all the pins and everything else, make sure the propellers and the arming wires were in and everything else. I'd go out and visually check it, and Ray was pretty good that did that, uh, our armor gunner. And so I could once in a while look at A lot of times I didn't even look. He was, he was good, he knew his job, and all the work had been done already, see. So did you, do, did you use the Norden or the Sperry bomb site? Norden. Tell me a little bit about that. How, how did you, how did you, how did it work, and did you actually aim the bombs? Well, you, you use the bomb site, and you kill your drift of some of the knobs and get you on course first, so you're drifting towards the target the way you want, you're, you know, crabbing into the wind, and then you get the rate, which is your rate knobs up here. You preset everything, though, knowing your altitude, the kind of bombs you're carrying, and all that other stuff. There's a bunch of stuff you preset. So. And your altitude drum, you preset that, you know the altitude you're going to be at. Uh, but it's got to be the ground out from you to the ground, so you make some compensations, you know, for terrain and all that. But anyway, once you're going, then you, after you kill your course, to go to, towards the target, then you go ahead and you kill your rate, which is the speed that you're, in other words, this is your, uh, not your azimuth anymore, but your your distance from the target. You just keep putting the crosshairs on there, making any minor adjustments, keeping it in the target all the time, trying not to make any violent moves, because if you do, you'll tumble your gyro. And the pilot in this point in time is trying to keep the, air, the airplane as steady as he can, keeping the speed constant, and not any fast maneuvers. You know, it's, you want as stable a platform as possible for this, to be accurate in your bombing. And I mean, that's the way it worked out. And then the indices would meet in the thing on your bomb site. Boom, the bomb be bombs away, and away we went. We went into a dive usually, and, you know, down and away <laughs> to get out of what flak there was, you know. And sometimes it was practically no flak. Sure. And as I understand it, as a bombardier, you were pretty much flying the plane that last few minutes? At that, yeah. On the bomb run, you have complete control of the airplane. He, you, you know, he keeps it at a steady speed, whatever the speed of the group is. You know, he keeps it at a steady speed, straight and level as much as possible, and uh, maintains the altitude, all that, as much as possible. And sure, you're directing it. But as soon as bombs away, as soon as they drop, he's back in charge. Sure, sure. Um, what was your biggest challenge as a bombardier? I mean, what? What was the hardest thing about being a bombardier? Or... I don't know. I, I don't think I can say anything was hard about it. You just did I it. mean, it, it, the training was pretty good. You learned your job in school and everything else. And I don't think there's anything hard about it. it was, I'll tell you, when you're younger in that age, the whole thing is like a giant adventure. I mean, you're not unhappy about it. You're very happy about the whole, the whole thing. It's just a big adventure. You're a young kid. You don't know any better. And uh, everybody I knew felt the same way. Hmm. Um, the um, it, it must have been nerve wracking though. I mean, with the flak flak going yeah. off around you because you're there in the nose of the aircraft. You're trying to keep yeah. it steady. You're you're concentrating on your heads down, right? You're looking yeah. down yeah. into this thing, and then you could be running into flak. Yeah. That must have been nerve wracking. Uh, well, when it came close, it was. When it was off in the distance, it didn't bother you that much. But this one raid I told you about around St. Valentin, where I got hit in the flak suit, 
that was the only real bad one we ever had. There, as we hit the IP, your initial point is you go on your bomb run. Off in the distance, you could see, and it's even in the, same, the book here, you can see a black triangle, I mean, a, a, a black rectangle off in the sky. And it was a perfect rectangle, the width of a box and about the depth of a normal box of planes. And all we did was just head for that, and we had to go right through it. And all of the flak was in that one little spot, like a barrage in that area. And you had to go through it. And there's nothing, and that was the worst one I ever saw. I never thought it was unusual to see something like that. And you went through it, we got, I don't know, we had several hundred holes in the plane. Uh, we lost, all the ga gas tanks had to be replaced. Part of our oxygen system got shot out. We had, I think, almost 300 holes in the aircraft. Nobody got hit. I was the only one that got hit, but it hit me in the flak suit, and it, it contained it, so I was fine. And but to, as far as being afraid, yes. If you're not afraid, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> did, you uh, did you often wear your flak suit? After that, always. <laughs> always, yes. Until I, then. I was sort of half-hearted, you know, because you go to the hard stand, you get out, as everybody did, where they had all the flak suits, or you go in there, and you take one, put one on, and sometimes... Well, you did, maybe, you know, but you usually put one on, but you weren't too, you know, you didn't worry too much about it. But if you get hit once in a flak suit and it does the work it's supposed to do, when I, when we started flying after that, what I did is I'd go over there and all the extra flak suits left over, I'd take them in the nose and line up that whole nose, the plexiglass on the side. Because you're sitting on a piece of armor plate, a quarter inch thick, that protects your, your bottom. If something's coming straight up at you, if it's coming from an angle, it's not going to do you much good. But I helped out a little bit. I took all the extra flak suits, put them around the side with the glasses, where it wouldn't obscure my vision or anything else. Just as a precaution. <laughs> well, you know, it, it sounds like you it was a come to Jesus experience yeah. with, the, with, with that. You got religion real quick. And that's know. right, that's right. And all of us did. You know, all of us were scared stiff, believe me. And I'd, speaking of that, um, I want to, you know, hit something that's kind of, ask you something that's kind of serious and that sort of thing. It's, it says that there's no atheists in foxholes. Um, how did you, how this did is, you deal with this? How did you get through? Was it just guts? Was it determination? Was it, was it I religion? Don't I don't know what it was. I mean, we just did it. It's the job we're supposed to do. We did it. We knew there'd be some risk, but we never figured, like everybody at our age, you never think it's going to happen to you. Well, you, you can't think it's going to happen no. to you because if you get that sort of yeah. that sort of attitude, yeah. you're not going to do your job. Yeah. It's just I didn't not... know if it was religion or what, but we all persevered and did our job, and luckily we all got through it. No one in my crew was ever harmed. I was the only one that was even hit, but luckily I had the flak suit on, it hit me in the right spot. But then I, and and when uh, when were you? Uh, when was your uh, combat tour? Well, roughly what months or years? I started flying here probably in early March. 40, 45. 45. Yeah. So you were late. Well, I was very late. Uh, when I, I have it's a long story. I mean, I was, we were supposed to go to the South Pacific originally. Because you, because you, you, you entered in August. Yeah. Or December '42, and you didn't get over. Yeah. Well, till... I'll give you a little story. Sure, okay. please. I, I went in. You know, when you know when I went in, I went in in February, reported for active duty mm -hmm. in '43. So I went in, and we went over to uh, Miami Beach. We had our basic training. We went on to college training detachment up there in uh, in, uh, in Al Meadville, Pennsylvania, Allegheny College. And from there, we went to classification. We finally get over to, uh, from classification, we went to Maxwell Field, Alabama. The classification was in, Max in T Nashville, Tennessee. Then we were there for several months. Then I finally ended up going to primary flying school. I was there, I didn't have that many hours, and boom, they were going to wash you out. Really, they had so many pilots, they didn't know what to do with them all. So they asked me what I wanted for the rare crew training, as I pointed out before, and I had a big hit. I thought I must have qualified for all three, and I talked to the girl in the office, and I wheedled some information. She says, sure. yeah, and she gave it to me. So I did go to pilot training. Uh, I didn't last long there. And then I told them I had to want further air crew training, as it turned out, I, and that was okay for me to go to volunteer school. After that, I we went to a navigation uh, to a a uh, bombardier pool in Moody Field, Georgia, 
Valdosta, Georgia, which was full of German prisoners from the uh, Africa Corps. They had a free run of the base. They were running all over. If you went in sick call, half of them like six foot three blondes sitting next to you in short pants, you know. <laughs> you, can, you know, they in the PX, they ran, they had free access to the whole base. They ran around just like... Not a bad life, right? No, they had the best life in the world, believe me. Uh, not like some of our prisons were treated, you know. I knew a number of guys that were treated very, very badly, you know. One of the guys in our group ended up in Russia. I mean, they traded him off somehow in Russia, and he was in Russian labor camps. Everything imaginable happened to this guy. Wow. So they were lucky. I mean, they had a pretty good deal. It was a good way to get out of the war, and they were safe. We almost got out of the war on this raid I'm telling you about, because we were real close to Switzerland. I was also the navigator that day, because my navigator was lying in another crew. And we had lost two engines in the bomb room amongst other things, and uh, we pulled out of it. Now, we couldn't keep up with the group because on only two engines, so he asked me for an emergency heading, so I gave one for Bern, Switzerland. I think we were real close to it, and I don't know, you know, two engines only, another one not acting as good as it could, part of the oxygen out, and he says, no, no, he says, we're going to go back to Zara on the Yugoslav coast, the emergency field. He says, Craig, you're nuts. We're going to have to, if you do that, I says, we're going to have to go just a little bit east of uh, Venice, and over there there's a German airfield in Udine with that four or five hundred fighter planes sitting there. And, and I you're says, coming you know, through with two engines. And we're and coming through with two engines. As, as it was, we were only, we were only probably two a little over two engines are out, really. One of them was acting up. So we weren't quite full two engines. Anyway, believe it or not, though, we flew over the Udine, we we're coming home, and we we're only about 8,000 feet. We could not keep any altitude. Uh, no fighters, our so-called fighter escort we had, P-51s, were nowhere in sight. I never saw hardy fighter, I never saw any fighter escort. They were always down the ground strafing and something, you know, enjoying themselves, shooting the place up. Pra target practice, you could say. Well, we never had any escort coming back, and we went right over these, the Udine, the, the German fighter, not even one aircraft came up. Luckily for us, you know, we hit enough of their oil to make it impossible for them to you to come up, or they had orders, like a lot of groups, not to go up at, at, unless you have orders. So nobody came up. We would have been sitting ducks. Oh yeah. It ended up we got home uneventfully. Uh, we were still not one engine wasn't working real good. We we're still losing altitude all the time. We got to Zara, and Craig, our pilot, he says, you know, I think we can make it across. So we went across. We landed at our base and everything else. So it was uneventful in the end, and no one got hurt, and we didn't have to jettison anything. But that was a memorable trip. I'm sure, I'm sure. I um, want to uh, shift gears here and ask you a little bit about navigating. Um, what, did it, what did it mean to measure drift? What's the well, you have a drift meter, and you point it down, and it's, it's got little markings on it, you know, for the compass, compass markings. By looking through the drift meter and everything else, and you finally get it straight so you're going, it's, the line's going in a straight line and it doesn't, that means that you're going with the wind. And then you find out, you put they plot what you call a wind star. And this E6B computer, which was also known as an E6B uh, confuser. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you did this in three headings, you know, and this would, you would plot and then where all the lines would intersect, then you had the direction of the wind, the speed of the wind, and you knew where it was, so you could compensate for drift. So if you figured you had to go to a certain compass heading, you compensated for that by the amount of the drift, and you subtracted or added that to give you the, the compass heading you wanted, which would put you in course for the, your destination where you wanted to go. Sure. But it wasn't a difficult thing, but it was fun doing, really. But we went on a navigation we had navigation things besides dropping bombs and going, you know, and dropping bombs in the bombing range. We also did a lot of navigational trips like that. That's where we, I, you know, learned how to do dead reckoning, what they call follow the pilot. These are the two minutes. I didn't have celestial, but I had as much of that as my navigator did. But the, the celestial is the one that takes a long time to learn. So uh, tell me a little more about dead reckoning, that, that 
What, what, what did it mean to do dead reckoning? Well, dead reckoning, you do it all, you do it all, you know, using your drift meter, you can't look out, and you you got a map, you're using a Mercator projection, which is a nice square, it looks like a crossword puzzle, I mean, it all lines like graph paper. And you plot everything on there where you start, your coordinates now, where you start, and you're going so many miles at so, so, such a speed, and you point, then you should be over here, then you figure it out from each place and you give them an estimated time of arrivals which you think your speed's going to be and everything else and then if you're doing it right everything will check out you'll be flying there and going there and going there and you're arriving where you're supposed to arrive and we used to go to like four or five places and then come back to the base so um, did you uh, did you when you were a navigator did you only rely on dead reckoning or did you also no. use a, a Never landmark used it really <laughs> No, because you could always see the ground, you know. If you ever were in a position where there's, you know, clouds under cover, you'd almost have to use it because you could, you wouldn't Or know. over the water, for yeah. example. Because you'd have to depend on your briefing where they would give you the winds aloft at the certain levels, what the, the speed was in knots and what direction it was coming from at all the different levels because wind is, could reverse itself 180 degrees at a different altitude. It's all different. Mm -hmm. You said celestial reckoning. That's that's the celestial that's the, navigation. That's the one where you the shoot the sun and the stars and that, and that's what the navigators get. And that's the hardest part to learn. The other's much easier. But you didn't. You wouldn't. You would rarely need that. Or, well, I didn't. I wasn't with my crew. I got separated from. They flew their plane a plane back. Not ours, but we didn't have any assigned plane anyway to fly. You flew what they assigned to you. And uh, he used it. He uses the he uses the celestial shooting sun lines and stuff like that, and it worked. <laughs> it's the only opportunity he ever had to use after he left navigation school. Sure, sure. In terms of um, in terms of uh, 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 navigating uh, versus being a bombardier, um, if you were a bombardier and you were not lead, did you do your? Did you still? Sometimes you did. We we flew deputy lead once or twice. That's and why I, you could float have up it. there if the first, I had first ship gets knocked out. Yeah, because yeah. that one time we went to that at Lin, the raid in uh, Saint Valentin, we lost I think I don't know probably thirty forty percent of our aircraft. The one right next to us, and you're flying a very very tight formation. In those days, towards the end of the war, they had what they call a formation stick, which was all you know. Electrical system you control. All the pilot had was something just like one of these game boards you play, I guess. And all he had to do was go like this or like this or this way or this way, and you could turn the ship and everything else. It was all set. It was much easier than, you know, trying to control it with just using the regular steering apparatus and your foot pedals. Uh, seven teams were very easy to fly information. B 24s were much more difficult, a lot harder. You had to be a hell of a lot better pilot. To fly one of those in a tight formation. Well, that's what I heard. I heard it. They're like flying Mack trucks. Yeah, very. I mean, the pilot had us, the navigator and the bombardier, a couple of times fly in bombardier school. You know, put us behind the wheel. I got in the pilot seat, and the navigator was in the co-pilot seat, and used to steer it. You know, you turn it, nothing happens for a while, and it slowly turns, something like a boat or something like a big boat. It's not like when you're in primary school with a little plane. As soon as you do something, it does it, you know. Bomber's quite different. That's a big, heavy thing. And, uh, yeah, it's very cumbersome. And uh, to, you know, fly an information, I'm sure, was very difficult. This formation stick they came out with was a godsend to the pilots because it was very tiresome constantly, you know. It was much more difficult to fly than the 17. That's why pilots like the 17. Much, much easier aircraft to fly. And it was harder to fly a 24, especially in a tight formation. Because our pilot used to tell us that, because he had flown both of them. He says, there's nothing like flying a 17. <laughs> he says, it's easy. I also heard the 17 was a little more, was it a little more comfortable? Was there? It was quieter, probably a little bit quieter. They had the one advantage of, uh, of height. They could fly at a higher you know, much higher altitude we had. We had the Davis wing, which didn't have a lot of lift, but had a lot of speed, which was a forerunner of all your jet aircraft. Supposedly, the Davis wing was one of the biggest landmarks in aviation history. I read later, I heard about that later. The fact that the laminar flow wing when they made way for the jets, the jets to be developed. And anyway, uh, 
What was I saying? I forgot. <laughs> oh. Talking about uh, the Davis wing. Yeah, the, the Davis uh, wing. So we couldn't fly as high. So consequently, most of the gunners, the German gunners, you know, they pick us out because we were lower and easier targets. And if they were, you know, like one group coming in or nearby, they shot at us more so than the 17s because, I mean, they shot at the, us because we were lower than the 17s. If the 17s could bomb up to 30, over 30,000 feet. But we were lucky to get to 24 or 25,000 feet. But of course then, but you did have a heavier bomb load or you could put an extra gas, yeah. use we one could, of the bomb bays with gas, yeah, the correct? The 24s had greater range than the 17s and we flew faster, had a greater range and had a bigger bomb load. So our advantage is, you know, strategically wise in which bomber you would use because we had the range that they didn't. Well, you know, we had the bomb capacity that they didn't. We had the speed that they didn't. Of course, the B-17 is immortalized because of the Hollywood Air Force, right? The 8th Air Force yeah. showed those things off. So as I remember it, something like three times as many B-24s were manufactured oh, yeah. as B-17s. As a matter of fact, the 8th Air Force, 47% of all their bombers were B-24s, not B-17s. So it was almost 50%. But you wouldn't know it by any of the books you read or anything else. <laughs> You'd swear they were all B-17s, and right. you know it was the sort. You know, it was the saying we had in the 15th. He says it's still the same old story. The eighth gets all the glory. It's like we were one of the forgotten air forces, you know. But the eighth did get all the publicity, and in as much as maybe Clark, Clark Gable happened to fly in a, a B-17, and he was at our gunnery school, incidentally. Not just before I got there, Clark Abel went through Tyndall Field, Florida, where he went to gunnery yeah, school. So, and I guess Jimmy Stewart was also 8th Air Force, I think. Was, was yeah, he, he was 8th, yeah. He ended uh -huh. up being, uh, you know, group commander. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. you know, and, you know, that's, uh, of course, you know, George McGovern was 15th Air Force. We don't, yeah. he was, didn't learn about he was, him. For, he was across the street from us. He was in the 455th. He was right near Churchill, you know, where we were. He was, he got there, I think, about a month and a half before I did. I know he was our pilot, too. Sure, sure. Um, he was not across the street, but generally speaking, yeah, yeah. All the, he was in the same wing as we were. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and and uh, in terms of uh, kind of a lighter, lighter stories, lighter side of things, um, when you weren't flying, and I've seen the, some of the flight schedules, you could be flying three or four days straight, if weather permitting and so on, and targets permitting, but when you weren't flying, what did you do for recreation, or fun? Uh, did you have any fun when well, you weren't we drank. I mean, we used to get uh, wine very cheap. Oh, yeah, vino. Get champagne was a dollar a bottle. Wine was less than that, you know. Uh, we used our cigarettes for our trading items. We used to, you know, go on little trips if we could, you know, get away. Uh, we would go into adjacent towns and stuff like that. We are at our Repel Depot, which was Caserta, waiting for before we went to Barry, Italy, we were able to go into uh, Naples, and we spent time in Naples, but we were living in a tent in the mud and the cold, and our, it was freezing cold, and we had to shave and put our Class A's on before we went into Naples, though. So we'd hitch a ride, you know, in a British truck or one of our trucks, and we, we managed to shave in cold water out standing outside. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I've seen the photographs. It was snowing. I mean, you think of, you know, southern Italy. It's like, oh, it's the French Riviera. It's going to be warm all year yeah. round. I'll be one big, you know, it was snowing. It was cold. Everybody thought that we're in sunny Italy, you know. It was freezing cold and snowy and muddy. And, but we shaved outside from a cold water sticking a spigot, spigot sticking out of the ground. And we shaved out there and braced ourselves so it wouldn't fall over and shaved and everything else and put our clothes on. And, but we go, it's the only way you get into town. You had to have class A, your blouse on, everything. So we went and wore pinks and all that. But we'd go in there. We, they had places that were off limits, which we managed to go to anyway, and places like that. And we had a pretty good time. I had learned German uh, in, in high school. I took four years of it, so I was fairly fluent in German. And it helped me out a great deal because when I spent time in Marseille, I could talk to the girls, which we usually went uh, to see the opposite sex, you know, for a little enjoyment. And a lot of them wouldn't even admit they could speak German. A few of them did, and I was able to converse from them. The same was true in Naples. So it did sort of help. And of course, from what I understand, the uh, 
the young, the, the young women's mothers would frequently come, come along to try to keep an eye on them. I didn't have that problem. We were, didn't, didn't have that much free time. Uh, and just, we'd go into town. There weren't that many women, really, but there were, so depending, Naples there were, and Foggia there was. Foggia was nearby. We went there to take a dry cleaning of Foggia. Sure, sure. Another sort of uh, kind of a lighter topic, but I still think important. In terms of the uh, camaraderie you felt with your flight crew, uh, obviously you would have been an officer. You have four officers and the six uh, non-coms who were, were the gunners and so on. Did you, uh, did rank really matter though in terms of? Not a damn bit. Not a lot of, not a lot of, no. you know, uh, no. kind of regulational or disciplinary stuff going no. on. On very rare occasions, it never, very, very rare occasions. Uh, one time, uh, the rank business, we were in phase training, we all went to a bar together, the whole bunch of us in Tonopah, Nevada, which is midway between uh, Las Vegas and uh, Reno. We're out in the desert in the middle of nowhere. And there was a few gambling places there. Anyway, we went there to drink. And one time an MP came in, and all of our whole crew was together. And he says, you can't be with the officers. And our officers says, what do you mean you can't be? Come on. But they made us, they separated us. I mean, that, that's the only time it came. A couple of other times it came up. Once, uh, when we were, left Marseille, we went in a, a boat to Naples. And what happened there was... We were all playing poker in one of the officers' clubs, and the British, being so rank conscious as they are, had several officers' clubs for various ranks, you know. So we were in one, apparently, for the higher-ranked officers. So most of us were in fatigues and things like that. We were like seven of us playing poker, six, seven. And one of these British captains or majors come, comes over, and he says, you and you and you are going to have to leave. Luckily, we had a bird colonel with us. <laughs> so he spoke up. He said, you see, the, and this guy, this British captain or major, whatever he was, his face got red as a beet. And he said, sorry, sir. He saluted, clicked his heels, and left. He says, you know, the guy, the guy told him, leave us alone. We're not bothering anybody. Just go away, <laughs> which he did. Well, rank has its privilege. Yeah, I mean, it was funny because this boat we were on was a French liner run by the British Navy and our enlisted men like got two meals a day. They had to have a, like a bucket or something like that. We had three meals a day, six to a table. A British mess boy, about 16 to 15 years old, waited on us. Uh, you know, it was really great, I mean. And the way they served the British, we sat there for our first meal. They come in, they bring a plate. We see all these casseroles sitting on the side there. And we're waiting for the rest of the food. And he says, why don't you eat? He says, well, we'll bring it on. He says, you got it. Great big plates. He says, you eat this first. Then there was maybe some a vegetable on there. So you eat that. They take all the plates away, all new plates. Then the next thing comes out, it'd be maybe another vegetable or something, or a starch. We'd eat that, all new plates again. This is unbelievable. The ship was so crowded with people jammed together and, you know, our enlisted men were treated so poorly, and we had civilians. We had people from probably a dozen different countries, guerrilla fighters, women guerrilla fighters, men, uh, uniforms. I don't even know what country they were with running around the deck. It was, it was a hodgepodge of every, all kinds of humanity there. But we had nice accommodations. The, the navigator and I had a great big room to share. And the whole meal went like that till it was finished. Everything was on the new plate. We even had tea time at 2 o'clock, a British butler with a nice, beautiful outfit, like out of a movie, went by with a gong, and he's hitting this gong, you know, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We heard this noise, what is it? It went out this year. And we asked him, tea time, sir. They have tea at 2 o'clock, they serve in the ship. You get keys, crackers, or cookies, or something like that. Well, they, you know, well, they, It took the, us two days to get there. Well, the, the hierarchy, though, in the British military in the British Navy is much, much more strict and much more different. I mean, you know, I, I remember hearing about uh, American servicemen stationed in, 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 in England, you know, preparing to, to go in. And, you know, the Tommies, the, 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 the British soldiers, were paid one-tenth of what the yeah. Americans were. And they, 
You know, they were, uh, you know, they would snicker about the Americans being overpaid, oversexed, exactly. and over here. I remember that expression. And yeah. so, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me. No. But it was, I, I think it definitely build, built camaraderie, though, yeah. among your flight crew not to ha have those ranks so strictly uh, we, demarcated. I basically, mean, in your crew, you, you, everybody, sure, they had separate quarters to live in, but that was over. Only one time a pilot got mad. I being the bombardier, you were in charge of armament. So, so the men didn't clean their their guns, you know. And one of them jammed just just in trying to shoot. We never saw fighters that came and attacked us. We only saw two Messerschmitts one time, and they were recon planes. They came out of a cloud. I could see the guy plain as day, both of them. They almost hit us, and they were surprised to see us. So we were to see that, you know, we were to see them. Uh, they had camouflage underneath. There was sky blue underneath and camouflage, uh, various shades of beige and brown and olive drab on the top. And they took one look at us, they saw us, and they just went back into the cloud. <laughs> and that was it. Flap was our, big, our only problem, really. Sure, sure. Um, got a couple more questions for you. Okay. Um, uh, when, did you, I, uh, when did you finally get back to the States, and when did you separate from the... Okay, from the when we got... When I told you that one day I was, I had flown these missions, I mean, you know, what I flew in was all the 456, one day happened to be in the tent. The other guys weren't there. Guy comes into the tent and he says, I'm looking for Vartanian. I says, that's me. He says, well, you got one hour to pack up, you're being transferred. I says, well, wait, what do you mean transferred? Is there are crews here? He says, that's it, I got orders for you here. He gave me a copy or something. That was it, so next thing you know, I'm on a truck Going south in, in Italy, we stopped for lunch at uh, the 98th group. I met some guys there that were part of people I knew in training, and they had beautiful barracks, uh, all millwork, everything, beautiful bathrooms, and all the silverware and the plates all had the German swastika on there. The Germans left without destroying anything. They had to leave in a big hurry, apparently. I was going to take a couple of the pieces of silver, you know, Stainless steel were just like the Americans, real big forks, real big spoons. And uh, they all had the swastika and the eagle on, everything did. But anyway, we left there and then they finally got into our group. And I found out they were leaving in a few days to go back to the States. Because they started out in North Africa and they were out there in early, I guess if they're in the Halpro group, they were there in 42 over North Africa. A lot of them got there very early, maybe some in 42, I'm not sure, I don't know. But they all had enough points to get out. So the next thing you know, they, we burned everything up and buried everything, and cleaned off the tents. We had to leave it according to the Italian government the way we found the land. And they destroyed everything, you know, and buried it, food, everything, clothing. We had to turn all our stuff in, and they threw that in the pit, whatever we had turned in. They didn't really salvage anything. Food was a shame, you know. But I did keep my 45, and I think I kept. Uh, some of my navigation, my chronometer, and a few things like that, which I thought, heck, I'm going to bring it back, you know. And I also ended up with a brand new carbine, still in Cosmoline. The uh, 45s, I didn't have my own 45, I went and got one. Forgot to tell you, we're in the 456. The first thing they told us to do is turn in your 45s, you're not allowed to fly with them. That's, that was the 304th wing commander, the commander of the 304th wing, or group commander, whoever it was, we weren't allowed to get more trouble than anything else. We had no 45, you couldn't fly with guns. Hmm. And I forgot to tell you, too, when we got to Marseille, as soon as we got there, and he says, if you're going to go into town, the first thing you do is go to the MP and get ammunition, get to keep your gun loaded and keep one in the chamber because they're having racial problems there. Especially if you're a white officer, that was it. I, and everybody, Believe me, everybody in Marche carried a gun. Even the nurses should go carry carbines over their back on slings. I mean, that's how it was when we got there. And then we go to our group to fly. They took them away from us. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, you know. Well, um, I've got one last question for you. Okay. And uh, this is a question I ask all the veterans, whether yeah. they're soldiers, sailors, yeah. airmen, or marines. Yeah. And uh, do you consider yourself to be, quote unquote, a hero for what you did? Hell no. No, I don't think anybody does. Why not? What did we do? I mean, we did what we were supposed to do, number one. Number two, as I point out, when you're younger, you think you're invulnerable anyway. 
And everybody in our crew figured it was like a giant adventure. And we all felt the same way, you know. I think practically everybody did, I would say, unless they had some real harrowing problems, like some of the guys who were shot down went through hell, you know. They had stories it's hard to believe sometimes, but if you didn't go through that, you know, I mean, we were lucky. I didn't fly that many missions, really, in reality, like some of them did. I ended I was home for VE Day in Chicago. And also, on the ship we went on, it, was, it used to be the USS America, we got back in seven days instead of 28 days to Marseille and all the other. Uh, we had Red Skelton on board, who entertained us all the time. And that guy is a real wonderful man. I, I don't think you'll ever find anybody who'll say anything bad about the guy. He's great. He's wonderful. And all he did was tell jokes, and he would never run out of any. And one time we were on deck, it was a bunch of nurses in front, because he put it in one performance on every day, you know, for everybody. But he had the little ones with groups all, all day long everywhere. But they had a bunch of nurses in the front, and a few of them got a little off color, you know. And some of the nurses all got up, they got a little red in the face and everything, they got up and left. But uh, we sort of got a kick out of that, you know. But it was all uneventful. We got back, and, and you know, I had taken that 45 with me, and the, uh, and the uh, carbine, brand new, and we had to sign each other's uh, customs declarations, and they said you were taking government property, it was a like, a crime to do this, and he could be in prison and all that. So I threw the carbine overboard. I went on deck that night before we got into uh, Newport News, same place we left from. And you go up on deck, and you can hear the thing is going over the side. Everybody's getting cold feet and throwing things over. I didn't have the nerve to do the, the 45. I had a beautiful 45 I got from the, the armament officer in, in the group. Brand new, satin blue steel Colt. Beautiful, you know, not one of those parkerized jobs. And I didn't have the nerve to throw it over. I had to ask the guy, you on it? He said, yeah, I'll take it. Because they were supposed to check our baggage. and never checked a darn thing. <laughs> and everybody was so angry at that. Yeah, woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? Yeah, I mean, it didn't. what would, what would the government be out? They are going to throw it away or give it away anyway. It's not like they didn't have a, a million carbines out there anyway. Well, there's a brand new carbine and there's probably many more laying outside, maybe a few miles out of that harbor, I'll tell you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. And, about and, and this thing. was very enjoyable yeah. and I appreciate yeah. your willingness to yeah. share your memories. Yeah. Well, they didn't have anything good for us after that. We found out we got 30 days leave. We went to Atterbury, Indiana. And after that, uh, we went to B-29 school. And we were formed, we were going to be the nucleus of new groups and get, you know, we were supposed to get uh, promotions and everything else. I never got one promotion because I never stayed long enough. Sure. My crew got them after I left, you know, everything. I still got out of flight officer. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Is that it? Yes.